Hi everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Josh Wright Piano TV. One of our audience members from this YouTube channel recently wrote a message to me asking if I could go a little more in depth into dealing with discouragement and depression at the piano. And while I don't have personal experience with any clinical depression, um, I do have a lot to say about discouragement. There's been times where I've definitely felt depressed and um, discouraged even recently. And the message of today's video that I really want to impart is never let your self-worth or self-esteem be defined by your skills at the piano. That's number one. Um, that's fairly obvious. But number two, more importantly, in my opinion, more importantly, is when you're in the throes of piano studies, never let your self-worth or how, how much you like yourself be determined by one piece or one spirit specialized skill. For instance, um, and I'm going to get real personal in this, I'm going to tell you some of the weaknesses I've had in my life, um, not to, you know, try to uh, invoke a bunch of <laughs> criticism or to also invoke a lot of people saying, oh yeah, everybody has mistakes, so I'm not going to work on mine. I still work on these skills pretty much daily, but these are things that are hard for me. Uh, for instance, um, this A2, the Opus 10 number 2, that's a really tough piece for most pianists because you're targeting 3, 4, 5 the entire time. And I've met numerous pianists that just never are going to perform that. And I'll probably never play that on stage unless I'm doing like all 24 Chopin etudes, in which case I'll just swallow my pride and play it a little slower than most professionals do. But uh, m many pianists struggle with that. So if you're struggling with that etude in particular, don't feel bad. For me, um, trills in thirds at high tempos with standard fingerings. And you're probably rolling your eyes saying, who cares? <laughs> My wife has said that many times. I can do inverted trills, fine. You know, I can do that. Three, two, five, one. Three, two, four, one. Four, two, five, one. That one's a little weaker. That takes some work. I've I've gotten it up good in the past when I really work on that inverted fingering. But if you put me in a standard fingering like three, two, f uh, three, one, five, two. it's much less comfortable in my hand. And you'll see a bunch of really young pianists all the way to professionals be able to whip through those. And I've never been able to do that. Even with, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of great instruction over the years, but I still have never received any instruction that has put me in the tempos that I want. And that is not a lack of hard work. I worked on that recently for eight months straight. I still can't do it as fast as I'd like. I can get it up to about 120, 125 um, which is not even close to where I'd want to be like if I'm using my inverted fingering. Uh, another skill, I have a young student. He's 14 years old. He worked on the Earl King for two days. He said, I, I really want to learn this piece. And he came back. And the whole piece was in that tempo. After two days of work, and I was like, Oh my gosh, I've never seen a student do this before. And it was the loosest, most natural playing I've heard. I mean, it, it's as fast as any professional recording I've heard. I mean, it's probably faster than what I just played. And yet, he was also working on Jado by Ravel. Um, and for the life of him, he could not get that tremolo, which... I got probably within like 20 seconds when I did it because I've played tremolos elsewhere. So we ended up making up a little cheat. He just does this. And you can't even tell um, the difference. Uh, I have had other friends um, with, with the standard fingering. Pianists I really admire with double thirds. They couldn't do it either. They can only do the inverted or vice versa. Um, I have had many students... Uh, and and even colleagues say, you know, um, Opus 25, number 12. Sorry, that was sloppy.
they really struggle with keeping their hand loose, or opus 10 number one. Whereas those etudes, um, you know, I haven't played them in years, but those were never big dilemmas for me. And yet, um, <laughs> these little finicky etudes were just torture for me. There's been other passages that I've had to simply just work through. I remember a simple one, Mendelssohn's Serious Variations, gorgeous piece. Out of all the difficulties in that piece, all the jumps, never really too big of a deal. It was this little guy. Doing a chord rolled up in my left hand, easy. Down was much, much harder. This was many years ago that I played that, but that, um, and I'm totally out of shape on it. Just to get that took me a lot of work. It was just, it was a skill that I hadn't ever had to really work through before. It was, it was very strange. And I see pianists, I remember one of the great regrets of my teaching career. Um, I was still pretty young. I was probably 21 or 22 when I was teaching, or probably, maybe, yeah, probably around 22. Um, I was teaching this fabulous retired guy from North Carolina, and he may even be watching, and hopefully this is a, a good um, motivation for him. Um, but I haven't talked to him in years. And he was playing wonderfully some Chopin etudes. He had all of his major and minor scales up to 160 BPM on, um, so somewhere in, in that type of ballpark, nice speed. I mean, nothing, nothing to be ashamed of whatsoever. And um, he said, what are the hardest Chopin etudes? So I said, well, I mean, they're all hard, but some of the more difficult ones, like that they make you play at the first round of the International Chopin competition, you have to choose between that one, the, the double thirds, or the winter wind. And he said, okay, I'm doing all three. And I was like, that's not a good idea um, to try three of the most difficult pieces in the piano repertoire. And I mean, yes, there's other tough stuff, Petrushka, Gaspar. So, you know, don't roast me in the comments saying, no, it's not the hardest. These are tough pieces. Okay. And he, um, he said, I'm going to do all of those. And I said, it's a, it's a terrible idea. Why don't we just try one? I think that you can maybe handle the winter wind to start with, uh, Opus 25, number 11. And he said, no, I'm going to do it. And I was like, I'm, you're going against my advice, but okay, I'll, I'll try my best to help you. And being the inexperienced, well, I wasn't an inexperienced teacher, but I'd taught since I was 15 years old and I'd played all these pieces. And I just was like, okay, we're going to see how this work turns out. It destroyed his self-confidence so much that he quit piano. I should have put my foot down. Even though I warned him several times, I, I should have said, no, we are not going to do that. He probably would have done it anyway on his own time. But the point of all of these examples is to show you that every pianist has weaknesses. One of the best young pianists in the world, no, I'm not talking about Daniel Trifonov because I talk about him a lot, but I'm not going to share this pianist's name. He's someone I greatly admire and respect. Uh, he and I were uh, talking just over Instagram a while ago, and I was <laughs> saying, do you have any third drills tips? And he's like, oh, I don't even remember what I did. He's like, and I was like, oh, you just make it look so effortless. And he's like, well, Josh, he's like, you probably don't even need to do that fingering if you can handle it in your inverted fingering. And I was like, I know. And he's like, you know, something that I've struggled with my entire life is basic trills in the right hand. And he's like, my left hand's fine, but there's something about basic trills in my right hand that I've had to work 1,000 times harder. He's like, I've probably spent 1,000 times as much time on trills in the right hand than I have in the left hand. And like my jaw was on the floor. I was like, are you kidding me? Because he's one of the finest pianists in the world. And um, you would never know that he struggles with trills. He's fixed them. But it just went to show that certain pianists, and I've heard famous pianists say that they avoid certain pieces because they're like, it just doesn't fit my hand well. I don't play that well. I don't have that specialized skill. So never let one piece or one specialized skill define your self-worth and discourage you from playing the piano.
Having said that, if you have a foundational skill like scales or arpeggios or chords that you really struggle with, you, you have to work on those. That's a reality. And I'm going to keep working on my, you know, standard fingering double trills. And I, I like to just mess around with that. I just like the way they sound. And I think that it's very relaxing type practice. Um, and I love that particular etude, even though I can play it with a different fingering. I, I like exploring that other fingering. Um, I, I guess I have a serious case of OCD with that piece. But uh, having said that, never be Never let yourself get so discouraged and down. And maybe you do need to take a step back from a particular piece. The only time that's really hard to do is when you're playing a set of etudes. Like when I was playing all 24 etudes as a teenager, I just simply had to. And a lot of my etudes were a lot slower back then too. I'm not saying I was in professional tempos with all of them by any means. Maybe not any of them. I can't even remember my tempi, but... Um, uh, having said that, I, I just had to, you know, take them slightly slower. So if you're playing all the list transcendental etudes, but the the um, trills in faux fillet, those are a real bugger. If those are giving you trouble, or if you're playing Mazeppa and 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 the the jumping around gives you trouble, well, maybe you need to work through that. Maybe you can't just. Uh, you know, drop that piece and say, no, I'm going to play the whole set of transcendental etudes except this one. Then it will be like, oh my goodness, what's wrong with his hands for that one? So you do have to sometimes push through with certain things. But if it's just one piece that you like the sound of and you just can't get it, or one piece that's always bothered you, continue to work on it and, and search for new creative ways but never be defined and let that be a catalyst for you quitting piano or feeling horrible about yourself because this is a journey. Like I said, you would never know from that young pianist that trills were an issue for him, but he had to slave over that. Other pianists have told me pieces that I find very unintimidating just kill them and vice versa. They'll say, oh yeah, I, I can't play that piece. I'm like, are you serious? But then I know they play a piece that's so difficult for me that, I, I mean, for me, the Chopin Concerti, which I'm working on the the second one, the, or the first one, I've played the second one a lot as a teenager. Uh, there are places in this first Chopin Concerto that intimidate me more than I think any passage in Rock 3 that I played just a couple of years ago, Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto. Um, and most people would say, are you kidding me? The Chopin First Concerto intimidates you more than Rachmaninoff Third? And the answer would be, yes, it does. Certain passages kind of freak me out in that, whereas uh, most passages in Rachmaninoff Third, I don't know if it's because I learned it when I was younger or what it was, they didn't bother me as much. It was still a difficult piece, and I'm not saying I played it perfectly, but different passages will challenge pianists, different pianists in different ways. So I know this has been a little long-winded, but I wanted to give all those examples. I wanted to make sure, especially during this time of like the pandemic, I think it's all, we're all a little bit more prone to anxious or depressive feelings and never allow yourself to be defined by one piece or one skill. Keep working at it. Um, I'm going to keep working on my skills. All the amazing pianists you look up to, they're still working on their skills too. There's very few pianists. There's probably a few pianists in the world that don't have too much difficulty with most things, but even those top tier pianists still have to work. Some of them are the hardest workers you'll ever meet. Um, like I know, I remember my friend Joel Bognar talking about being uh, at a festival, I think it was in Switzerland, and watching Argerich and Babayan practice night after night through the night. I mean, just marathon practice sessions. And here are two of the finest pianists in the world, and they are the hardest workers. So never shy away from it. You know, keep working hard, but don't get down about it. I hope that helps. If any of you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. I'm going to leave a few links in the description below. One of them is for a free webinar containing 10 of my favorite tips to take your playing to a higher level. These are tips I still use every single day um, in my own playing and in my teaching. I'll leave a couple of links for uh, a couple of my paid courses um, if you'd like to go even deeper than this channel goes. Uh, over and finally a link to my uh, gear kit uh, basically a collection of things that I use in my career like all the gear that I'm using to film this um, theory books that I've given my students CD recommendations piano bench discounts things like that so you can check that out as well 
Have a great week, everyone. Good luck in your practice sessions.